Welcome to Otter Creek Online. In just a few minutes, you're joining us virtually for our worship experience, but before we do that, we wanted to take a moment to acknowledge that some of you joining us each week online are longtime members of the Otter Creek family, and some of you are new to this online Otter Creek experience. You may even be watching from a different state today. We want you to know that our leadership team has a strong desire to know who you are. We want to know what you care about. We want to know what you're interested in spiritually. We want you to know that we want to know how we can help you grow. So here's what we want you to do very practically. If you're watching live through YouTube or Facebook, would you put something in the comment section telling us how we can reach out to you? We have a lot of ways of knowing metrics, but we don't know who you are in the online community. If you're not watching live, you're watching later in the week, would you send an email to our community life minister, james at ottercreek.org. He will get back with you. But our desire, just like with our Brentwood campus and our West End campus, our desire is to know who we're serving and how we can serve you better in the weeks to come. Thanks for joining us online and we hope to hear from you soon. Okay, everybody's still asleep. Let's try it one more time. Good morning, Otter Creek. It's so good to see each and every one of you. Good morning to all those in person and those that are joining us online this morning. We are so thankful that you're here with us at Otter Creek, a family growing to be more like Jesus. And today is one of our favorite days here at Otter Creek is when we get to introduce you to our new family members. So it's our new member Sunday. So first up, we have Cade and Emma Aspinwall. Cade and Emma are both Harding grads who love the outdoors. Emma enjoys knitting in her free time. Cade enjoys board games, football, and basketball. And next up, we have Kyle, Daniela, Kinley, Hannah, and Reese Chenoweth. Kyle and Daniela are both ACU grads and have been married for 10 years. Daniela is originally from Texas. She enjoys interior decorating, art, home renovations, cooking, and gardening. And Kyle grew up in St. Louis, Missouri, and he enjoys hiking, grilling, and do-it-yourself projects. And our last but not least is Deanna and Hubie Smith. Deanna is originally from Memphis and is the daughter of OC member Sue Bonner. She leads the Sarah Cannon Research Institute in Nashville and is also the board chair at Pepperdine University. Hubie is a Harding alumni and coached basketball for 36 years before retiring from Brentwood Academy. And Hubie and Deanna are both passionate about family and Christian higher education. And they have three grown children and three grandchildren. So let's give it a big hand and applause to our new family members. <laughs> We're definitely blessed to have them. We're glad to have them here and glad to have each and every one of you. I'll now turn your attention to Cole. Members joining us and joining the Otter Creek Church family. And for those of you who are interested in just going deeper and getting to know this church better and getting more plugged in, I really strongly encourage you to, uh, to reach out to JB and start that process. And JB, man, we're grateful for you and your joy and your energy and the excitement that you bring. I don't think he's ever had a bad day. I'm sure you have, but it doesn't seem like it. But JB, we love you. So before we sing, I want to set the stage for our time of worship. For many of you, this, is, this gathering is something that you experience every single week. Hopefully it is. When we encounter something on a regular basis, most of the time and oftentimes it can quickly become ordinary. It can become normal. It can become mundane. For, for instance, where we live here in Middle Tennessee, it's so common to see wildlife of all kinds. I saw a possum this morning crossing the road, and I didn't hit it, but I saw it crossing the road as I was driving in, and just the incredible wildlife that we get to see every day in the hills and the trees and the rivers and the waterfalls. And I am very grateful to be from West Texas. There's a beauty in that part of the country, but for the most part, it is incredibly desolate and dry and hot and windy, and, and there are no trees or hills or there's nothing. And so I am grateful to be from there because I appreciate where I currently live. 
But as grateful as I am for the incredible hiking adventures that I'm getting to experience with my family and my kids, I fear that my kids are not going to have the same appreciation for the beauty around us because it's something that they experience every day and all the time. And also, in the city where we live, we are inundated with entertainment. We can experience some of the greatest productions and events in the world every day of the week, including Sunday mornings in some churches. From concerts of any genre to pro and minor league sporting events to music festivals and main street festivals, indoor, outdoor water parks, the list goes on. So there is no shortage of world-class entertainment if you have the means to afford it. And let's be honest, most of you in this room have the means to afford it. So my question is this, are we becoming desensitized to the creation around us? Does a beautiful sunset or a deer crossing the road or a massive flock of birds flying with such perfect synchronization strike a sense of awe and wonder in us? And when we gather together in the space to give thanks to the one who made the beauty all around us, are we bored to tears after a week of entertainment indulgence? So my challenge to all of us is this. In 2023, don't let this gathering be mundane. Open your eyes and see the beauty around you. Use your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength to worship the creator, not just in this room and in this space, but in every space that you're in. Sing with joy in response to it. Raise and clap your hands in surrender and gratitude and celebration. I'm going to say this. Some of you look mad out there sometimes on Sunday morning. You just look mad. And some of you have your arms crossed and just frowns on your face and you just kind of we look like we said something wrong, but you, some of you refuse to sing one word. My kids, a few weeks ago, after church, they say, Dad, why do the grown-ups look so mad? After service, after our time of worship, they ask that question. So church, let's choose to be grateful. Let's choose to participate in worship. And may the children of Otter Creek be filled with awe and wonder of God because the grown-ups are. Can we say amen to that this morning? Amen. amen. So before we sing, let's go to Psalm 104. Praise the Lord, my soul. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty. The Lord wraps himself in light as with a garment. He stretches out the heavens like a tent and lays the beams of his upper chambers on their waters. He makes the clouds his chariot and rides on the wings of the wind. He set the earth on his foundation. It can never be moved. The birds of the sky nest by the waters. They sing among the branches. He waters the mountains from his upper chambers. The land is satisfied by the fruit of his work. He makes grass grow for the cattle and plants for the people to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. He made the moon to mark the seasons, and the sun knows when to go down. How many are your works, Lord? In wisdom you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. There is the sea, vast and spacious, teeming with creatures beyond number, living things both large and small. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Praise the Lord, my soul. Praise the Lord. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide. It trembles at his voice, trembles at his voice. Sing it out. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. And day. Time. 
This morning, Amen. who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me! Oh, his love for me, who the sun sets free. ransom me his grace runs deep while I was a slave to sin Jesus died for me yes he died for me who the sun sets free oh is free indeed I'm a child of Yes, I am in my father's house. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against. Me, I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. Can we celebrate that news this morning? That's good. Jesus, you're greater. Here we surrender. You are the Savior. Yes. 
Savior, greater. All the praise, all the thanks, all the glory to your name, all for you, Jesus. Jesus, your grace.
Jesus, all the praise goes to you, for you are worthy. We thank you for your love and your power. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the beauty around us as we worship and we sing and we lift up your name with our brothers and sisters, with the ones that you have made in your image. And we see your beauty in the creation around us. We're grateful for this time to gather. We're grateful for our time to share in communion and our time to give for this time of offering. You have offered everything. You have given us salvation. You have restored and renewed and brought us back to God. And for that, we are grateful. And so we give. We give with time and money and our voices and our lives for you have given yours for us. We love you and we praise you in your wonderful, beautiful, powerful name. Amen. 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 Have a seat. Our guiding text this month as we think about what it means to be a local church that makes a difference for the kingdom of God, our guiding text has been this one verse from John 15, which Jesus says, I am the vine and you are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit because apart from me, you can do nothing. We unpacked that last week and I dwelled in that last phrase, which is so hard for people who are driven and accomplished and educated and whatever level of success you feel like you've achieved in life and the goals that you've had, Jesus is saying, don't, don't ever get this twisted. You only have meaning and life and sustenance in me. Everything comes from me. Everything that is good emanates from my center and my being. So I want to pause um, as we begin this teaching time and continue in our worship just to recognize Dr. King's birthday, which we celebrate today and tomorrow in American culture. And there's so many different ways we have celebrated Dr. King over the years, and we've learned about Dr. King, and there's no one right way to do it. But as a local church, it seems like the right thing to do to honor the only preacher who has a day actually named after him, right, in the American calendar. And by the way, you may be surprised to know this was a contentious fight for a long time to have a day named after Dr. King. But Dr. King was a Baptist preacher who forever changed the way that we think about freedom and equality, not just in the United States, but also around the world, especially in places like South Africa. He did so because he took Jesus seriously. I grew up in a context where I heard members of my family question his faith, question his authentic commitment to Jesus using words like radical and communist. But any honest study of his life will reveal that he was a man of deep faith. He knew the Bible better than most of us will ever know it. And he was connected to God in a powerful way and just like the prophets of the Old Testament were rarely welcomed by the people of God, he was a prophet rarely welcomed in his own country. If he were alive today, he would be 93 years old. He was murdered at the Lorraine Motel on April 4th, 1968 because some in our country believed that segregation was not only a good idea, but that it was in fact mandated by the authoritative word of God. He died at the age of 39 to a racist named James Earl Ray, who murdered him in cold blood from the balcony of his hotel suite just as the sun was setting in Memphis. 
When King was murdered, when King was murdered, his three children were 10 and 7 and 5 years old. Think about that. We think about the legend being murdered, the father of a 10-year-old, a 7-year-old, and a 5-year-old. So I would just ask you, as your minister, if you've never studied his life or actually studied what he believed, don't post anything on social media this weekend. Instead, save that time of that one king quote that you were going to put on your Facebook or your Insta or your Twitter, whatever it is, and actually learn about king. Learn about where he learned nonviolence from the Sermon on the Mount and the life of Gandhi. Learn about the influence of his time in Boston and Chicago, in Detroit, and studying the teacher teachings of Howard Thurman. Learn about the way that the Exodus story impacted his entire imagination. Martin Luther King is a son of the church, and his life looked more like Jesus than my life will ever look. You know, it occurred to me, I've only been to London one time, but... One of the few things that I remember and think about often is walking through Westminster Abbey. Some of you have had this experience, this historic, iconic church right in the heart of London. And you get to the one side of the abbey that most people don't make it to. And your eyes are fixated on this section of Westminster Abbey that is dedicated to the saints of the 20th century. Now, we're Church of Christ. We don't know about saints, period, let alone the 20th century, right? But this wing dedicated to the women and men who have followed Jesus to such a level that it cost them their life and great bodily suffering. And I remember, this was probably about 20 years ago, being so impressed, that far away from Selma and Atlanta and Montgomery that Dr. King's image was emblazoned in stone and bronze in this British church, recognizing the profound impact he had had, not just on Western ideals of freedom, but all over the world. When I look at King, I see Jesus because I understand more clearly what it means to believe that justice is simply when the truth becomes public. I see someone who, cons- who was concerned about those who'd been beaten up. He was in Memphis when he was killed to advocate for sanitation workers. I see a, a man who understood that you don't really know what you believe until you're willing to give up your body. I see a man who believed that God's will and his call is irrevocable in your life. So whatever you think about this weekend and whatever you believe, you have children and grandchildren under your influence, make today and tomorrow at least in part a conversation about how the Christian church and the scriptures of the New Testament were deeply, deeply woven into who this man was. So we've been talking about Vision 2029 and what does it mean to be a good local church and what does it mean to have an impact for the kingdom, even if we are this very, very small, rather insignificant part of this larger thing that God is doing through the church. And we ended last week by talking about the difference between being a member of an organization and a follower of Jesus. And while being a member of a church is not inherently bad, it can become dangerous because we lose sight of the edge of Jesus, like the kind of the searing power of Jesus in our lives. And so I made this claim that being a church member is not always the same thing as being a follower of Jesus. Again, they're not inherently in conflict, but they're not exactly the same. Church members don't always make good disciples, but good disciples always make good church members. Church members care about the organization, whereas a disciple wants to be a part of a movement of people who are experimenting with the love of God in real time with real people. So I believe, and I could be wrong, but all I can do every week is just tell you what I believe. I believe that our relationship with the church should be more like a covenant than casual dating. And some of you have taught me this. Let me say it again for those in the back. 
Marriage, covenant, right, is hard work. It's patience. It's daily forgiveness. Casual dating is, I'll see how this goes for a while, and as long as it works for me, then I'll stay in this relationship. I had a mentor tell me before I moved to Nashville. He said, one thing that will surprise you about Nashville, and this is a person who was born and raised here, he said, you will not believe how easy it is for people to change churches. People will stay, he said, more loyal to their sports team than they will their church. And I'm not saying that's true for everybody. I'm just asking us to have a hard conversation about what it means to be a part of this community of faith. Because sometimes people leave a church for good reasons. And we need to hear that. Sometimes people experience power games and corruption and lies and secrets and authoritarianism and boys club. You can be part of this, but you can't be part of this. There are sometimes good reasons that people leave church. And so we have to ask ourselves, and you can only answer this for you and I can only answer this for me, but I have to ask myself, what is it that I really believe in with this community of people? If COVID gave us any gift, it was to ask the hard, awkward questions of why am I doing this? Some of the most tender conversations I had with you during COVID, usually at a lunch table, and someone went from talking like this to there, now they changed the voice, and I was like, okay, here comes the good stuff now, <laughs> right? It's like when my grandma used to put her hand over her mouth, everyone can still hear you, grandma. <laughs> Whatever you're about to say, can you believe she wore that to church? Your hand did not help, right? But you're at the lunch table and someone lowers their voice. And it was hard, but some of you said, I'm questioning why I'm part of a church. COVID was just weird, right? It shook things up. It made us ask questions. I was on your TV and let's face it, I don't have a face for TV. I have a face for radio, right? You're like in your house, like listening to me. And it's like, what are we doing? Now, when I use the phrase local church, I'm not just talking about Otter Creek. So I don't, if you're new, I don't want you to think, well, he's just obsessed with helping build this thing here. That's not what I'm talking about. When I talk about the local church, I'm talking about Brentwood Baptist and Brentwood United Methodist. And I'm talking about traditional church and coffee house church and intentional house church like we see in Rome and Corinth in the New Testament. I'm talking about church in prison. I'm not just talking about maybe traditional organized church, but when I talk about church, I don't just mean you had a great brunch with your friends on Sunday at 10 a.m. I mean the sacraments are there. Baptism is available, communion, the word, worship. That's what I mean. Any kind of gathering of people that's sacramental to say, we want to put into practice that central meaning of the Lord's prayer, that we want to see manifest on earth all the things that are true in heaven. That's more than just a good conversation. That's more than just a good vibe, right? That's actual intentional community of people who talk about Jesus and talk about what it means to be a part of his church. And so one of the questions that we have to ask ourselves in this January kind of reset, reorientation, is a question that I have been surprised how relevant it becomes each passing year as secularization takes over our country. And this is simply to say, do you want to be a cynic or do you want to be a servant leader? Now, I actually have a tender spot in my heart for cynics because most of the cynics I know at one time were optimists and life has beat you up. And it's just too painful to be hopeful and optimistic because you've been disappointed and let down and beat up so many times. But what the church needs in our American cultural moment are servant leaders who are filled with more hope than cynicism, believe there's more beauty than death, believes there more, there's more good in the world than there is evil. What I mean is we take on what Paul called the mind of Christ. 
Jesus was very aware of the Roman Empire. He was very aware of slavery as it existed 2,000 years ago. He was aware of prostitution. He was aware of money exploitation. He was aware of the honor and shame system that drove the entire economy. He was aware of the Pharisees. He was aware of the temple tax. He was aware of all the corruption. And yet Jesus lived with this profound sense that the love of God was stronger than even the cynicism of the day. So I'm not asking you to be like me. I'm not asking you to be like somebody else. I'm not trying to give you a self-help motivational talk. I'm saying, could it possibly look like taking on the life of Jesus, the skin of Jesus, the words of Jesus to say, you know what? I could be a cynic. I've got my list. I keep it in my back pocket, but I still believe that hope and love and faith are the greatest of these. See, I am an unapologetic super fan of the local church. It's why I chose to do what I do and why I think God called me and God called many of you to do what you do. I love the local church because it gave me a place to belong. From my various early ages, I loved going to church. I loved getting in the car. Who's gonna be there? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna talk about? Like what's gonna happen? The church reinforced my parents' teachings about Jesus. My parents were red letter Christians before it was cool to talk about being red letter Christians, right? The main thing was the red letters of Jesus. And most of the churches that we were a part of growing up, even as we moved from Kansas to Michigan, most of those churches talked a lot about Jesus. The church was safe for me, and that may not have been your experience. I can only tell the truth of my, the church was safe for me. We were having hard conversations about the body in the church that I grew up in. We were talking about desire and what do we do with our lives and what does it mean to use your education for God. The church was safe to talk about faith and doubt and science and all of these big things. The church was safe to use my gifts. The church allowed me to use my gifts even when my gifts were not very obvious. Some of you know what I mean. You got on the Sunday night JV rotation for leading singing, you had no business being in that rotation, <laughs> right? When we were living in Wichita, one of my dad, my dad was the associate minister and one of my dad's good friends knew that my brother and I uh, were very, uh, let's say high energy. <laughs> Uh, I'm a three on the Enneagram. My brother's an eight if you speak in the Enneagram language. So we wore my parents out all day, every single day. We wore them out, my parents. When we went to college, they needed like a two-year break from us. We were so exhausting, right? But this guy knew we were wearing my parents out all the time and just how much energy we had. And so he made two miniature wooden pulpits and he put a note with them to say, you guys don't have to wait until Sunday to have church. You can do it every day of the week. That guy was a liberal in the mid eighties. Now, as I've reflected on that, there's only one problem with that story. There should have been three pulpits because we have a sister. We let her do the announcements, no offense. (laughs) Oh, you can get offended. You're the one that taught us that. But we've talked with my sisters and we've gotten older about that. And what was her place in that story? Because my brother and I, we were, every door was open to us, every door. I remember on Sunday night, them having to take the, the extra stool and place it on the pulpit so that my brother and I were tall enough to see over to say 738, 728B. And here, right? So of course, I'm positive about this experience because there was always space for me. Now, what I'm saying is let's create that same space for everyone who walks in these doors, genuinely searching for the heart of God. The church gave me baptism, which is a whole nother sermon story. (laughs) Eucharist, communion, and great friends who are still friends to this day. I'm still friends with people that I was in first grade and second grade with in church. And there's nothing more beautiful than having friendships in the church that last you your whole life. And some of you have those and you know how sweet and how beautiful that is. Now, the New Testament weighs in on this in some interesting ways. The New Testament talks about us 
the body of Christ. Again, Brentwood Methodist, Holy Family Catholic Church, Brentwood Baptist, the belonging, whatever, whatever community it is, it's not about the name on the sign, right? It's about the intention of the people there within the community. And the New Testament talks about the body of Christ or the church in these robust ways. The New Testament talks about Ephesians 2, the church is the family of God. This is where I cut my teeth in ministry several years ago uh, as an intern for Dr. Rubel Shelley at the Woodmont Hills Family of God. Many of you know the impact of this church. Some of you were part of that church and the incredible things that they were doing, not just for churches of Christ, but for the kingdom of God in Nashville. And they chose that biblical language for their church straight from the Bible and had thousands of other people in our tribe say, you can't do that. And they're like, it's in the Bible. Yeah, but it's not in the Bible the way we like it in the Bible, right? The gathered, Matthew 18, Acts 5 says, and these women and men were publicly gathered. Ecclesia, synagogue, just a gathering of people who intentionally have their hearts set towards the teachings of Jesus. The body of Christ, Ephesians 4 and Ephesians 5. Hosea 2 and 2 Corinthians 11 and Matthew 25 and Revelation 19 talk about the church as the bride of Christ. That we are somehow, even through our flaws and our imperfections, we are somehow unique and special to the mission of of God. I guess what I'm trying to say is I think the New Testament has a higher view of you than you have of you. The New Testament has a higher view of you made in the image of God, baptized into the mystery of the saints, than sometimes how you feel when you wake up on Monday morning and all you can see is everything that's wrong in your life. What I'm saying is one of the beautiful things about our gatherings each week when we come as Cole encouraged us, enjoy. I was laughing so hard when he says, and some of you look so angry. I'm like, Cole, they think that they look happy in that moment. Like that's, they're doing their best. Like that is their happy face. <laughs> you should see their frown. <laughs> but when we gather and we speak encouragement to each other and we exhort one another, all this language we know that is the heart of the church, what we're reminding ourselves is you don't get to define who you are. I'm, I, that goes against all Western sensibilities of self-actualization and self-help and all of that coaching language. The church says we gather because we're going to remind each other who we are and who God says we are. And God says that we are made in God's image, created in love, created for love, and created to spread the mission of love. So I guess another way to say that is like God becoming flesh in the body of Jesus, the church, we are the messy incarnated word of God in everyday life. God steps into dockers and Nikes and vineyard vines. God knew that grace and truth needed a body. So he created at the end of Jesus's life, a new body, a new Israel to keep the story going. And we're a collection of messy people from various backgrounds and perspectives and addictions and secrets and all these things that make us complicated humans. We are this collection of people that Jesus wants to use to make himself known and adored. As a non-believer said to me recently, I'd go to church if it wasn't for hypocrites. And I said, well, that's the only kind that exists. Well, I'd go to church if everybody was like me. Is that what you're saying? Not a hypocrite? So we gather each week, we grow, we give, because we want to create a healthy church, which our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren can find their place in the kingdom of God like you got to find your place in the kingdom of God. Through COVID and secularization and political polarization, man, all the experts came out and said, this is the death nail in the church. But we know history. We know what happened to the church through the Spanish flu and World War I and World War II and the Civil Rights Movement and Vietnam, 
The church is resilient. We know what happened to the people of God in Torah and the Jews during the Holocaust. We know how the church has survived all kinds of persecutions on the continent of Africa and in South America. One could argue that the church is the most resilient entity in the history of human civilization. Now, time will tell, but one could argue that if you can't kill Jesus, not ultimately, you can't kill the church. Next week, we're gonna start a series walking through the Lord's Prayer verse by verse. And I think often of that line at the end, the, the, the doxology, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. The reason the church can't be killed is it's not ours, it belongs to God. If it was ours, it would have been dead a long time ago. But every time it looks like the church is on the cusp of complete irrelevance or having no influence in the world in particular cities, God does something. He, God creates a movement. God raises up a new generation. He creates a new movement of people to reclaim the heart of God. And the unique opportunity that we have in this church in the year of our Lord 2023 is to say, God, help us to be on the right side of history. Help us to understand exactly how the spirit is moving and working because we want want to shed our organizational de denominational tendencies and we want to be a part of a movement of love where we're just a group of people engaging another group of people. When Paul wrote that nothing will separate us from the love of God, he was covering all of it. Pandemics, presidential elections, social isolation, the secularization of the West. Paul, when he wrote nothing, he meant nothing will separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Not hardship or tribulation or nakedness or famine or war or persecution, all of it. And right in the worst part of the pandemic, I stumbled on this way of thinking about it and I shared it with you one time about three years ago, two and a half years ago, and it has become so faith affirming for me. I just want to remind you of this. It comes from an old preacher named Earl Palmer who said the first time he listened to Beethoven, which I had this experience too. It's kind of like seeing, uh, I told David Rubio, it's kind of like seeing John Morant's dunk last night. Like I, when I saw it, I was like, your move, atheist. It's like, how does that just happen? I knew that was for five people and I still went with it. <laughs> but the first time I heard Beethoven, I had the same reaction. How could you not believe in God? There's so much evidence that creates doubt, but there's so much more that convicts me that God is alive, that God is working through us, that God is this, this invisible, immutable force through the Holy Spirit, raising up people who believe in love and justice and mercy and kindness. And so Earl Palmer, Earl Palmer says the very first time he heard Beethoven, he knew that God was real. And he heard Beethoven's ninth, which eventually, right, crescendos into this. he goes on to say, now imagine your local middle school decides they're going to play Beethoven. And the purists say, don't do that. Ludwig would roll over in his grave if he could, right? Don't do that to a masterpiece. Don't mess up something so perfect and so beautiful, so timeless, so classic. Just don't, don't, just don't do it. And Earl Palmer points out, the reason the middle school music teacher has those students play Beethoven is the middle school teacher knows that on a cold Tuesday night in December at Brentwood Middle School or Lipscomb Academy, that someone's going to stumble into that room and they're going to hear Beethoven for the very first time, 
even if it's being played by the middle school band. Philip Yancey wrestles with this analogy and he says, so why? Why inflict on those poor kids the terrible burden of trying to render that immortal Beethoven? Even the great Chicago Symphony Orchestra cannot attain that kind of perfection. Well, he goes on to say, the middle school orchestra will give some people, the audience, their only encounter with Beethoven's ninth. Far from perfection, it is nevertheless the only way they will hear Beethoven's message. So the next time you squirm in church or Bible class or Vespers or small group, remember what Yancey says about Earl Palmer. He says, although we may never achieve what the composer had in mind, there is no other way for those sounds to be heard on earth. That's the idea that sustains us in uncertainty, in chaos, in divorce, in feeling like complete and utter failures. You are part of this larger symphony in the church. And all we have to do is play our tiny part and trust that God in the fullness of time is using all of Christianity to bring history to its fulfillment in the new heavens and the new earth. Or in theological language, Paul wrote it like this. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, so that with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which has, he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe according to the working of his great Power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority, power, dominion, above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. Let's stand together and read this. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. God, we pray to you as Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And we thank you for each sacred story that is represented in this room. God, for every tender mercy, for every careful secret constructed. God, would you show us how everything belongs? Would you expose in us all that needs to be transformed? Or would you heal in us all the broken places? As together we pray the way Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I see the kingdom of heaven come near. I see the power of sin disappear. The cross is telling the story, the hope and the glory of you. I see the kingdom of heaven come near. I see the darkness beginning to clear. Our lives are telling the story, reflecting the glory of you. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory. All of the honor, all of the power forever, amen. I hear the sound of creation Jesus, the name that's above every name. Hear every nation rejoice.
sing resounding the glory of you. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. All of the honor, all of the power forever. Amen. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. All of the honor, all of the power forever. Amen. We've never had a home. Never had a home like heaven, heaven. There'll never be a king, never be a king like Jesus, Jesus. We've never had a home, never had a home like heaven, heaven. There'll never be a king, no, never be a king like Jesus, Jesus, we never had a hope, never had a hope like heaven, heaven, there'll never be a king, never be a king like Jesus. My name is Molly Martin. As we prepare our minds to gather around the table as a local church, I want to share with you something I wrote a little over four years ago, because I think it still relates today. Times of transition can be really exciting. Maybe you're about to start a new job, or return to school, or return to church. Maybe this involves moving to a new city or into a new home. Maybe you might even splurge on that perfect new outfit or an emotional support water bottle just for this occasion. Although transitions are meant to be exciting, if you're anything like me, they can also bring sleepless nights, uneasy stomachs, and shaky hands. It's so easy to allow the overwhelming amount of change blind us from the one who's guiding the change. The one who knows our hearts, the one who knows our strengths, the one who calms our fears. But scripture constantly reminds us to not be afraid. A few of these reminders can probably even be found highlighted in your Bible or written on your bathroom mirror. It is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Deuteronomy 31.6. Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Joshua 1.9. At the beginning of the summer, I started a new job in a new city. Remember, this was written a couple years ago. I'm not gonna lie to you and say that it was easy. Even though I was only going a few hours from home, it all felt so unfamiliar. I was afraid of leaving my close friends and family, and I was afraid of feeling alone. I eventually realized I was forgetting about the one who was also going on this adventure with me. I was forgetting about the one who was also packing his bags and never leaving my side. Sometimes I struggle to really hear God over the lies in my head. I struggle to really see God in unfamiliar places, and I struggle to really feel God when I'm sitting alone. But God was already prepared for us to struggle with this. In John 14, Jesus is telling the disciples about the promise of the Holy Spirit that will be sent in his name. Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. It's comforting to know that God never planned on leaving us alone. But do we really hear, see, and feel him? I find it helpful to slow down and really notice God around me. I should pay more attention to his nudges and his jokes and the way that he's working around me. 
Something I do to slow down this fast-paced life is I take three deep breaths, three long, drawn-out breaths, and I know it sounds a little cheesy, but bear with me because sometimes cheesy really does work. While taking these deep breaths, I like to imagine breathing in God's love and breathing out my own fear. And when I clear myself out of the way, it's a lot easier to realize God's presence around me. It's especially helpful to do this when we come to the table. I hear you, God. I hear you in the music. I hear you in the rustling of the leaves. I hear you in every I love you. I see you, God. I see you in the mountains. I see you in the flowers and the birds. I see you in every serving hand. I feel you, God. I feel you in prayer. I feel you in warm hugs. I feel you in every tear and every smile. I know you are my God. I hear your promises and I trust you. I see your works and I admire you. I feel your presence and I need you. I hear you, God. I see you, God. I feel you, God. I know you are my God. There's one more thing I've learned during transitions that I put off discussing because it's just one of those topics. So here we go. Transitions can also bring unexplainable tears. These can be tears of pure joy, tears of true mourning, or tears of unknown sources. Coming from a girl who used to rarely cry, these tears terrified me. I couldn't explain them and they made me feel weak. As I've become more familiar with these tears, I've come to realize something about them. Tears are not signs of weakness, but invitations to God's embrace. Let's pray together. Dear God, when we feel alone or momentarily doubt your presence, will you help us to breathe and repeat this? I hear you, God. I see you, God. I feel you, God. I know you are my God. We are reminded you are the one who is always waiting to embrace us. In Jesus' name, amen. mission as the church is to love and to love well and at the end of this life when we get to meet God face to face the only two things that will matter on a resume res, resume God will ask is did you love me and did you love people so let's sing this let this be a benediction let this be our charge as we leave here today